the Science Museum in Minnesota, and ad adjunct professor of geology and geophysics and water resource science at the University of Minnesota. Dan received his PhD in ecology in 1983 at the University of Minnesota, specializing in chemical and geology technology. It, what's especially relevant about this meeting is Dan's work uh, he and his staff work in the changing water quality of, of the upper Sip Mississippi River. This research provides much of the science underpinning for ongoing efforts of the substantially redu reduced nutrients and sediment runoff and restored ecological health of this impaired waterway. Dan has been studying this, our particular lake, Lake Pepin, for many years. Dan. Thank you, Mike. Pleasure to be here. Um, You've seen, I think many of you, uh, some of the material that I'm going to present today, so hopefully this is not a, a total repetition, but I think um, we've been engaged in ongoing work uh, to continue trying to understand particularly where the sediment inputs to the uh, Minnesota River, to the Mississippi, and to Lake Pepin are coming from, and hopefully I'll have some new information for you as well. Um, I did not list the many others involved in this project, but there are many colleagues, staff of mine, and, uh, and many others at other institutions that have been involved in this. I'll try to give them credit as we go along. Um, I got involved in work on Lake Pepin in more than 15 years ago. The Metropolitan Council was interested in understanding changes in phosphorus concentrations and loading in uh, Lake Pepin and in the Metro Mississippi River. Um, Kathy Larson here, who's in the audience, was one of those instrumental in pulling me in and getting me involved in that, that work. And we wanted to understand historically how the water quality of the, uh, of the uh, Lake Pepin and the river had changed, but we're really primarily interested in phosphorus. But in that process, we had to try to understand the uh, sedimentation in the lake because that's where the record of the phosphorus was, and I'll, I'll go over that now with you just a little bit. Okay, you've seen this uh, many times. It's become almost iconic. Um, the, the thing I would point out is, and I'll, I'll tell you how we got to this and how we figured this out in, in a few moments, just to review that, make sure you believe that it's real. Um, this last bar here is kind of interesting because this is actually uh, the result of coming back to the same core sites that we worked on in 96 and uh, filling in additional information for the decade, more than a decade of additional sedimentation that had occurred. But basically, um, we've seen a, about a tenfold increase in sediment input to uh, Lake Pepin. And uh, since uh, settlement in the early, mid-1800s, and we want to know how do we know that this has happened. I want to show you that. I want to show you information on where is it coming from and then what's causing the problem? What sorts of things are occurring that have driven this pattern here that we're seeing? And what's the evidence? So my role here is to give you a little bit of the science behind this. Okay. Um, why this important? Why is this important? I think everyone knows this and it's been covered already many times this morning. Um, we really need answers to these questions because ultimately the targets for the uh, diet for the uh, uh, Metro Mississippi and Lake Pepin and uh, the uh, parts of the Minnesota River are dependent on it. Uh, we need to know where the pollution is coming from and we need to know how much of it is natural. Okay, how do we know that sediment inputs have changed? Well, uh, you've seen other pictures I think this morning of some sediment cores. Here's a Here's one uh, that we're actually, this is not Lake Pepin, this is Lake St. Croix where we've done similar work. But sediment cores are a window on the past uh, and they provide us information about past conditions in lakes and their landscapes and their watersheds and in their airsheds. And they do this because the fine sediments, the silts and the clays and the organic matter and the algae all settle to the bottom wherever you have slack water and they accumulate over time. And, uh, and we can take cores of those and we can reconstruct this record back to for tens to thousands of years and, uh, and understand how, how the system has changed, how the inputs to that system have changed. 
Okay, this is the study that we initially did, and uh, we took 25 cores from Lake Pepin, and those are the red dots on there, and you can see they're arrayed in more or less five transects across the lake from uh, Wisconsin to Minnesota. Uh, and uh, the, the reason we took so many cores is because sediment accumulation in a lake, and particularly a lake like Lake Pepin, is not spatially uniform. It varies from the upper to the lower end, and that's not surprising. The river comes in at the upper end, it's got a big sediment load, the water slows down and the stuff falls out, and the rates of accumulation are much higher in that upper transect one there than they are in the lower end. And we dated about 20 of the best cores to back before 1800, and we extrapolated the, or, or calculated, the rate of accumulation across the entire basin. And that, those are the colored areas except for the light blue. The light blue are the areas that are sandy or bouldery or, or, or not accumulating these fine sediments. And now we're talking about sediments, again, silt and clay. This is mud. This is not sand. This is not coarse material. This is mud. Okay, we used a variety of dating tools, and I'm, just, I'm not going to go through these in any detail at all, but a variety of geochemical tools to allow us to tie the individual cores together, to paint a map, if you will, of the different layers of sediment that have accumulated over time across this lake. We dated it, uh, the sediments, uh, with, uh, with a number of radiometric techniques, like cesium-137, lead-210, radiocarbon, and uh, used a number of markers, such as pollen analysis, which gives us the timing of widespread agricultural development here in the watershed. Um, in any case, that allowed us to put together that graph that you, you've seen, and I showed uh, in a, a couple slides earlier, showing the um, uh, showing how sediment accumulation in the whole basin has changed over time. We are also able to calculate, given the volume existing in the lake at the time that we did the work uh, in 96, uh, how much lifespan was left in the lake. And this was really a revelation to me at the time. I thought it was pretty astounding, uh, both by uh, the volume of sediment that we calculated that was occurring and as uh, uh, Norm Senjum showed you, it's about equivalent to a cubic city block, which is a lot of mud. It's hard to imagine that river out there carrying that kind of sediment, but it does. And uh, so we have a measured volume in, in uh, uh, lake volume in, um, back in 1996, and we extrapolated, you know, at the break in scale, but uh, projected, uh, with the projected rates, the lake will be filled in 100 years. And the upper third, approximately, where the rates of sediment accumulation are highest would be pretty much filled in in about a century. And um, we went back to those same core sites about in 2008, found them exactly because we had put an X on the side of the boat, so it was really easy to locate the core sites. And uh, we took additional cores. We were able to very precisely calculate the additional sediment that had accumulated on top of that. And uh, we calculated how much had filled in, and, it as, as, and, th and then you saw the, the last bar on that graph, which summarizes that. The amount of material uh, varied, of course, from the upper to lower end. At the, um, at the upper end, uh, it was upwards of, um, let's see, about 40 centimeters. So that's well over a foot, okay, well over a foot of new sediment. And that's calculated as compacted sediment because the very surface stuff is quite watery. So when we did the calculations, we compacted it so in order to account for how that occurs over time. So, um, you know, we know this is happening, and we know the rate that it's happening at. And of course, the question is, where is it coming from? Okay, well, um, I want to dispel one urban myth, okay, and that it's of an urban source. And not that urban watersheds are benign, we know that. They contribute lots of things, and they have very uh, strong local effects on our, the streams and rivers that flow through our urban areas. But in terms of the impact on the sediment load in the Mississippi River, the effects are relatively minor. Um, what I'm showing you here are four long-term monitoring sites that the Metropolitan Council has collected, has sampled for, what do I have here, uh, 76 to 2005, almost 30 years. Actually, they continue to do it. So it's a very long and important data set. And among the things they measure are total suspended solids. And uh, what I'm showing here are the, the loads, basically, the total s amount of suspended sediment passing by those monitoring points uh, on average for that 30-year period. And 
what you see here is that between Anoka and the Ford Dam, which is this next place downstream, you got a lot of Minneapolis coming in there and a lot of the northern suburbs, right? And uh, you don't see an uptick at all in the amount of sediment. That doesn't mean that urban watersheds don't contribute much sediment, but it is not a big load when you compare that to what's coming down the river past Anoka, and it certainly is not a big load when compared to what's coming in from the Minnesota River, which you can see there. So this we know, okay? And, and so um, in, in terms of urban sources, we'll focus on them for other things. They are important. They are part of the problem, but they are not the problem for sediment not on the scale that we see accumulating in Lake Pepin. Okay, so the Minnesota River is the primary source for sediment, both past and present, 75 to 80 percent, and we know this. Okay, so where, what is the source of the sediment in the Minnesota River? And I think Norm went over this a little bit. I'll give you uh, some additional information about uh, one way that we looked at this. But basically the question is, is the sediment coming from upland fields, field erosion? Or is it coming from non-field sources, banks, bluffs, ravines, uh, which are prominent on the Minnesota River because of its geologic history? And I think uh, uh, many of you will know that history. The river was carved very, the valley was carved very deeply by catastrophic outflow from glacial Lake Agassiz between 12,000 and 10,000 years ago. And as a result, we have all these tributaries coming in, which have a very high gradient between well, the upland and uh, the river valley. And they have carved headward at a very dramatic rate, even in geologic terms. So we have a lot of bluffs, we have banks, we have ravines, and those look like really potentially important sources. And they are. They are very important sources. Okay, well, the, what, uh, there were a number of studies that the Pollution Control Agency funded to try to answer this question. And the one that we undertook was using geochemical fingerprinting. And the basic idea is here is that different sediment sources have unique fingerprints of tracers. And what are those tracers? Well, these are atmospherically deposited radionuclides, such as beryllium-7 led to 10 and cesium-137. The first two of those are naturally occurring. Cesium-137 is a bomb fallout isotope that, uh, that uh, we deposited all over the surface of the Earth when we were blowing up nuclear weapons in the atmosphere. Um, in any case, they have fallen or continue to fall on the surface of the Earth, and they enrich field, uh, fields with, these, these, uh, with, with them. They are enriched with them, and whereas um, 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 Stream banks, and I include bluffs and ravines, are not. There's a very minimal exposure to the atmosphere except along the face, and so most of the material that's derived from bank, field, and ravine erosion is deep materials, deep geolog geologic materials, which have a neg negligible concentrations of these. And you can see that in the diagram that I'm showing here. We have both beryllium and seven and led to ten. The red is the concentrations in bank material. The Green is the concentrations in cultivated fields, and the suspended sediment is the concentration on suspended sediment samples. Well, we took this and applied that uh, to um, a large number of sub-watersheds and uh, to uh, the uh, main stem of the Minnesota River and uh, the South Fork of the Crow, which of course is in the Mississippi River drainage. And we calculated the relative field contribution of present-day sediments to, um, to what we found either suspended in the river or where sediment had been deposited and draped over um, after a flood event uh, in, uh, in the river channel itself. And these are the numbers. And they vary between uh, a high of about 45, maybe 50 percent in the South Fork of the Crow to as little as 15 percent or less in a number of the watersheds. 15, that's a percent that is uh, from field sources. And this means the other half are from the non-field sources, the banks, the bluffs, and the ravines. And that's a really important finding. And, and, and it is corroborated by the other studies that have been done uh, uh, at the same time, basically showing that, that these are the dominant sources of sediment today. And this is really counter to what I think most of us thought not very long ago. And it was very easy to believe that the erosion from fields, which uh, during a good part of the year were without plant cover, might be the dominant source of sediment. And of course, most of our efforts to 
uh, reduce those sediment uh, inputs were uh, aimed at uh, uh, best management practices that could be done at the, at, at the, uh, on, uh, to, um, to uh, limit uh, sediment or soil loss, soil erosion from fields. And, and clearly that's not the case today. Um, so we see, depending on which watershed, which event you're looking at, and, 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 every, and, and, and so on, that somewhere around 60 to 85 percent of the present day load is from non-field sources such as uh, these bluffs. I think this is on the Lassur. Okay. Um, you know, well, it, the, the, there has been a change in the non-field sediment loading uh, to Lake Pepin over time. And uh, that's what's shown here in these red bars. Uh, we have a, an estimate at pre-1890, or really pre-settlement, that virtually all of the sediment was coming from these sources. And that's a, 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 an estimate or a, a, a guess based on the idea that under um, native prairie vegetation, totally, uh, total perennial cover on the landscape, that we had very little field erosion. That's certainly borne out by what we see today at field scale studies, that uh, perennial cover uh, is, is not going to yield much sediment. So most of the sediment coming down the river in the distant past was from these non-field sources. And those amounts have increased. And uh, we have three time intervals that we have, are able to look at with the uh, fingerprinting techniques. We can't go back much before about 1940. But basically, we can see that the non-field sources have really increased. And if I were to show you, and I didn't on this figure, if I were to show you there, my thumb was over it. If I were to show you the, the field trend over these three time periods, it would be essentially flat, okay? It really hasn't increased very much. And within the air, within, within the air of the method that we're using here, we can't say whether it's been going up or going down. The big increase that we see over time in, let's say, the last half century in Lake Pepin is being driven by these non-field sources. So the, the non-field sources have become progressively more important as a percentage of the, of the total load to the river. So why do these non-field erosion, why does non-field erosion increase? And it leads, of course, to the immediate question, have our rivers become more erosive? If they have become more erosive, why have they? Okay, well, possible hydro causes for increased erosion, hydrologic change that increases the intensity of river flows. We know that erosion in stream channels and rivers and so on is very much dependent on the character of the flow, the intensity of the flow, and, uh, and the time of year that occurs and so on. So something about the rivers has changed. The flows have changed in some way. Okay, what are the likely causes? There are two, two likely causes. Increase in precipitation is one, and this has been advanced as one explanation, and I will tell you the punchline in advance, it is partially responsible. Uh, each of those blue dots is the annual precept for, uh, for the region in those years, and the red line is a five-year running average. And if you kind of squint at that, you can see there's an upward trend. Um, I'll show you longer-term uh, um, uh, precept trends for the region as well a little later. but. Oh, wrong button. Um, we've also greatly modified the landscape. As uh, uh, Norm showed you earlier uh, in his uh, presentation about how we have changed uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the nature of the way water moves on this landscape, we've uh, channelized streams, connected, interconnected internal drainages, uh, drained wetlands, and installed a, a very sophisticated and extensive network of under, underground drainages or tile system. And so we've replumbed the landscape. Uh, these two things have occurred almost simultaneously. That is, we have seen, um, though uh, drainage and, uh, has uh, started um, earlier, the, the patterns, particularly the patterns over the last 50 years, as represented by the increased precipitation and, and drainage, have been co-occurring. So it's a difficult problem to say which of these is most important. And of course, you know, here's, uh, here's uh, tiling uh, drainage, which of course uh, started a long time ago but continues today at a very good clip. Um, we're not saying that this is a, the major cause. There's been other types of drainage, of course, as Norm showed, loss of wetlands and, and, and ditching and so on which occurred uh, particularly 
uh, um, well, continuously and, and from early on. Okay, so and then the, the next uh, the question is first to ask, has rainfall increased? And uh, if we're going to claim that rainfall is responsible for this, we better take a closer look at it. And this is a comparison of the rainfall amounts between 1940 to 1975 and 1976 to 2009. The reason we picked this time period is because we have flow records for about 21 watersheds going back to about 1940. So we can compare the rainfall changes to the uh, changes in flows in our rivers. Uh, what I'm showing you here are two months uh, uh, over this time period, and this is the, rain, the ratio, basically, of the rainfall present in the last, what, three dec four decades to the previous four decades, uh, uh, and, um, and for the months of October and June, and they're very different. We see that overall, the June precipitation has actually decreased and the fall precipitation has increased. And so basically, yes, but the, it is the fall precipitation, late summer and fall, that's gone up. And in May, June, and July, there has been no decrease, mostly increase, mostly a decrease. So this is important. Why is it important? 50% of the sediment is delivered to the river in May through July. And that's an important thing to keep in mind. Um, and that is the time of year that the rainfall comes in is critically important. And if you think about it, uh, uh, the early part of the growing season, we have much more limited plant cover that can evaporate water back to the atmosphere versus later in the season when we've got all the corn and the beans and they're really evapotranspiring to beat the band and able to shed a lot of that water. And the result is a very different effect on flow between the fall and the spring. Um, we've constructed graphs like this for each of these 21 watersheds. This happens to be for the Blue Earth River. And what you're seeing here on the vertical scale is the runoff ratio. This is the ratio of precip to the amount of water going down the river. And it is an indication, it normalizes for changes in precip. So if precip goes up, river flow goes, goes up. If nothing, if, if all other factors are equal, uh, you'd expect this line to be relatively flat. And it's not flat. And so we see that there has been a substantial increase in runoff. Uh, about a 60, the flow, adjusted for flow, uh, there's been a, about a 66% increase in runoff. And the important thing is that this increase differs among watersheds. And this is something Norm showed you already. So think about this for each of 21 watersheds and the, this, the change in runoff ratio between uh, these two time periods. Has it changed and where has it changed? And this is the graph that Norm showed you, or the figure I should say. And the, uh, the, the percentages are the percentage of increase in the runoff ratio. And you can see it's not uniformly distributed across the landscape, as Norm pointed out. It's a very, uh, the large changes occur in the heart of our, our uh, row crop agricultural areas. Watersheds to the west and to the north um, are, are much less affected. NS, NSC means no statistical change. So um, the largest changes in flow are observed in the highly agricultural watersheds. There is little or no change in the low ag, ag watersheds. So it would suggest that we have a, a very strong effect of agricultural intensification and drainage. These two things go together very, very tightly. Both the increase in drainage and the changes in cropping patterns uh, have occurred simultaneously. We have uh, replaced, effectively replaced, uh, uh, perennial covers like alfalfa and small grains with, uh, with um, uh, soybeans have been the primary replacement crop for that. Corn has stayed relatively flat, increased slightly, and that change, which has occurred over this uh, from 1940 to present, has also been accompanied by increase in drainage. And um, this is, I think this is really a, a pretty critical point. We have comparative watersheds. They don't all behave the same way. If it was rainfall that was driving the primary patterns we're seeing in river flow, they would change in much the same way. They don't. We have done something, and we've altered the landscape, and that's driving some of the patterns that we're seeing. Okay, the consequences. This is a study that uh, was also uh, uh, funded as part of this multi uh, multi-project effort uh, by the Pollution Control Agency. This was, work was done by my colleagues with the National Center for Earth Surface Dynamics, which is a, 
a, a, a consortium of uh, major universities across the country, including and is centered at the University of Minnesota. This is, um, it's very complicated, but I'll, I'll walk you through it. This is the sediment output of one of our important sediment contributors, uh, the Lesur River, and this is a sediment budget. And the Holocene, this is basically the, the long-term geologic rate from the time that the, uh, the uh, river valley was first carved uh, by uh, Glacial Lake Agassiz outflow uh, up to about the time of Euro-American settlement. And those different letter codes on there basically are the different sources. The BL is bluffs, banks, I can't remember what C is. Um, anyway, these are the amounts in uh, metric tons. This is uh, basically, this is the area above this nick point, okay? That's the, where the waterfalls are or were on these rivers. And uh, there's a big change in gradient of the river above and below that. And uh, basically what we're seeing here is this is the long-term geologic rate. And it's about 55,000 metric tons per year. Today, there's been the rate, as measured, is about four times that amount. So what we've seen is, uh, if we go back into the watersheds, look at, uh, use a different approach, a different geologic approach to understand what has happened in terms of sediment delivery. We see a major increase in sediment delivery in this one intensively studied watershed. So we are delivering more sediment to the river. We are also changing the river itself, both the tributaries and the main stem, and Norm showed you this, uh, widening of the river. Why do rivers widen? They widen because they're carrying more water. Rivers adjust to their flows. They can adjust both in their, their depth and in their width, and channel characteristics we can't assess from the historic photos how their depth has changed, but we certainly know they're wider. They're carrying more water, and of course, the material that they carve out is an additional load of sediment. This work is ongoing. Okay, let me step back to rainfall. Um, this has been suggested as uh, an important driver of the changes that have occurred over time. And uh, some have offered it as the primary explanation for why we have this tenfold increase in sediment accumulation in Lake Pepin. And I think this graph puts the lie to that argument pretty well. Um, but let's just focus on the, the uh, the current period, the last few decades, you know, say from about 1950 on. And you can see these are decadal averages in the sediment cores, but you can see there's an up and down that, you know, that kind of looks like those graphs. And you can see, for instance, that the uh, early 1990s, which is in this uh, narrower bar here, uh, was a period of very high precipitation. And, and so the first thing I would say is that river flows are important and that they are uh, strongly influenced by the amount of precipitation. And when we have more flow, we have more erosion, we have more sediment transport, and we're going to get more sediment into Lake Pepin. That's for sure. But you can see that as we go back further in time, the whole relationship breaks down. And that's because there's been a major transformation in the landscape that this rainfall, this precipitation, is hitting and is running through. And that's, that's the basic argument. You can't get from this to here from rainfall alone. The rainfall is hitting a different landscape than it was in the past, and this is changing the amount of sediment that's moving, and I think that's pretty clear. Okay, let me move on here. Uh, nor can rainfall intensity. We hear this sometimes, that we are having more intense rainfall events because of uh, climate changes that have been occurring in the last few decades, and these more intense events are causing more erosion. This is a graph of the uh, uh, proportion of uh, two-inch rainfall events uh, over time, and uh, you can see that it has varied, but that in the 100 years ago, we had similar conditions today in terms of rainfall intensity. And we're continuing to look at this data and try to tease it apart more effectively. Of course, the monitoring data for precipitation was not what we have today. Uh, it was a lot sparser, but it's very clear that, that rainfall intensity has gone up and down, but there hasn't been a systematic uh, monotonic increase up to the present day that would match that sediment uh, record in Pepin. Okay, so what does, what does that sediment record look like? Well, this is pretty obvious. It looks like the changes in row crop agriculture. This is a compilation of the land under row cropping in all of the watershed. 
uh, and that just laid over the sediment uh, accumulation trend in Lake Pepin. I'm not a fan of correlation because it doesn't provide you any information about mechanism and correlations can be deceiving. Things can be correlated because of other things that underlie them. But I think this is the clearest explanation for the multiple, multiple factors that have contributed to that sediment load. Um, one of the critical factors, as I think Norm so clearly portrayed earlier today, is the, the changes in hydrology of the landscape. This is the, the figure that Norm showed up from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service on loss of wetlands. I've just reversed the axis so it, it, it goes in the reverse. This is the in millions of wetland basins, and you can see we've lost a great deal of them, 90% or so. And the important thing is the inflection point on here. We see the period of greatest change right here from about 1930 up to about 1970, maybe 40 to 70 is when we see the biggest changes in sediment delivery to the system. And that's when we had the biggest, we made the biggest changes in, uh, in the landscape that affects the hydrology of the rivers. So, and, and of course, uh, this is the period of time when we, we see the big increases in on-field erosion. So I think we understand in, a, in a, a pretty clear way where the sediment's coming from, um, what the likely drivers are. Uh, so the conclusions, well, we have a big increase in sediment input in Lake Pepin. I don't think there's much disagreement about that. Uh, the primary source is erosion in the Minnesota River. The proportion due to non-field sources is, uh, has, has doubled in about the last three decades. Uh, agricultural intensification and drainage have increased river flows and stream channel erosion. I think this is almost an inescapable conclusion. We would add on top of that for sure that, uh, that uh, changes in rainfall have, have made that worse. If we've had increasing rainfall, the rainfall is impacting a different landscape than occurred in the past. But it is not the primary driver of the long-term changes we've seen. So that is, that is pre pretty much the summary of where we are today with the studies. We're continuing to look at the, uh, the uh, changes in flow, the analysis of flow in the rivers, the, the tributary study, and uh, particularly now relating that to the um, intensity of drainage that has occurred and the historical changes in drainage which are being assessed as part of that study. So that's it. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Since uh, I keep seeing this slide that the uh, the amount of water flowing to the rivers has increased and therefore the rivers have gotten larger, and I'm wondering if this is going to reach some sort of a steady state where the erosion will slow down once the rivers get to some sort of a steady state based on the increased water, which I believe is not getting any more anyways from, uh, from the fields. Um. I think that's a really good question. It's one that's been running through my mind recently. And you know, are we at, are we arriving at some new steady state? We can see that you know, with the ups and downs of the last three, maybe four decades, that there hasn't been a monotonic rise, a steady rise in, in sediment input. It seems to have leveled off a little bit. So one might guess that, except for variations in rainfall, we're, we're delivering what we're going to deliver to the system. Um, the question is, will the, will the river channels continue to adjust? Are they at some equilibrium with the current flows? We don't know that, and uh, we don't know how far out we are from that or how long it would take to arrive at a new equilibrium. Um, uh, very hard to know that, that, the answer to that question. Um, if, if we're close, maybe it's self-correcting. You know, we might see uh, decreases in sediment delivery because the rivers have readjusted to their new flow regime. And uh, that would be a nice thing to have happen. I mean, this is going to be a difficult problem to fix um, because of the, the changes that we've made in, in, in the way water moves across this landscape. It would be nice to be aided by some natural processes that would, but I don't know the answer. It's a great question. Great, you know, scientists love questions like that because we can work on them forever. Thank you. I've been looking at flooding for about 30 years on the Mississippi, and I actually have two questions about flooding. 
and during that time I've noticed that a lot of our major floods have happened since 1950. The vast majority of the big ones have been since 1950. And I'm wondering, I've always thought it was cultural changes that have led to that. Same thing that you're pointing up up here, the lack of uh, decreasing wetlands and so forth. Um, do you think that's the reason why we have all this major flooding? And then along with that question, um, one of the things I noticed when I looked at the uh, TSS sampling done by Met Council at St. Paul during the floods, uh, in particular the 2001 flooding, is that it appeared to show that there was about a million metric tons of TSS going by per day, and that's an annual loading. Now, I've only gone through those calculations once, I'm embarrassed to hear all the people, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I've gone over them same day and so forth, and I have them with me, but did you find similar uh, loadings from the floods, the major floods, and do you think it's caused from cultural or? Okay, two, two parts to that question, more or less. One, one about the amount of sediment being carried during big flood events, and um, I suspect that, um, that you need to go back and look at the numbers a little bit, but I don't want to argue with you, I think, that about that. I, uh, it may be that those were annualized, if you took those numbers for that period, it'd be annualized, but we, um, we have, it's over a million metric tons moves annually, but not a whole lot more than that, so you can't have that much in a day or a week, you really have to spread that out. But we do know that during these high flow events is when most of the sediment comes in. I mean, this is the way rivers work. It's not the average conditions, you know, that they get you, it's the events, especially when you're talking about loads. The average conditions are very important when we're thinking about uh, the TMDL or standards for improving or, or, or the, the effort to improve light conditions in the river. The average conditions are very important, but when you're talking about an infilling of, of Lake Pepin, uh, then the loads are, the annual loads are more important. Um, but, um, so I would say that, that uh, the, I would reinforce that the big events are important, they're really important, you know, for a very brief period of time we move most material and then other times of the year nothing's moving, right? Uh, the other part of your question about flood, flood frequency, flood intensity, and the effects of, of, of uh, uh, drainage and, and, uh, and so on on that, that's a, that's a really uh, a controversial uh, issue, and I don't think you would find agreement, agreement among scientists working on that problem. And that's because um, it, as we know, precipitation, and particularly late winter snowpack and spring precipitation is the primary predictor of, of, uh, of, of large flood events. And that's not surprising, you know, because we get a, a flush of water all at once, that's going to be our, our big predictor. And the, the degree to which land use has affected that, I think, is, is difficult to say. Um, we know from the geologic record that there have been some really monstrous floods in the distant past, and Jim Knox at the University of Wisconsin-Madison has done a lot of work on the paleo floods in the upper Mississippi and we, we had some real doozies. So we know that you can have a land, you can have conditions that will lead to major, major flooding even under, you know, pre-settlement pre conditions. That said, it's very likely, and in fact we, we, we should expect this, that the, it is the, uh, uh, the, the lower intensity flow events that will have increased. That, Norm showed that on the average annual flow and we're, uh, we're doing this work, we're picking apart the, the, uh, uh, the hydrographs for individual years and trying to understand how they have been altered, whether we've changed base flow, which is what occurs when, when, when you aren't having a big runoff event, or whether how the, the spikes in flow that occur from events and how those have changed. We would expect that the return frequency on midterm flood events would be higher be just because um, we are holding back less water. So. But I don't know where that, that break is, you know, which, which events. The large events probably would occur no matter what, but they may have been made worse. You're not going to get agreement from, from uh, scientists working on this. Yeah, uh, it seems like we're getting a lot of pieces of the puzzle here, but I think we're still missing a few pieces. Uh, for example, I live on the Minnesota-Iowa border in Martin County, and uh, every spring we have a large amount of runoff uh, in three or four days from the snowmelt. 
the soil is frozen, uh, we get a lot of uh, water going down our creeks and rivers, and it sloughs the banks. And soon as the, soon as it, the ground uh, melts or unfreezes, large pieces of dirt fall into the creek. So uh, over the next couple of months, you know, April, May, June, July, the river water uh, takes this sediment down. But in fact, it actually was an event that happened in March that June and July and May are getting credit for the sediment. So how do we fit that in the puzzle? Well, I, I, I think you, you painted a good picture of how the, we think some of this erosion is occurring. And clearly we get bank sloughage does occur uh, often in the early spring, as you point out, and then the river carries it away. The, when the bluffs slough, actually, they will put a big mass of material down at their toe, which will take several years to erode out. So it is not just the, the, the subsequent summer flows that will remove that. It will take several years to move that out. Um, the exact mechanisms by which these, these things are occurring and what contributes to them and, and makes them worse is something that we need more work on, for sure, to understand them. Um, fall flow, if you're, if, you're, if you're suggesting that fall flow is important, it, it can be, and we can have large amounts of sediment moving in the fall. Something I didn't show you here, but I'll, I'll try to describe, uh, is that we've had increase in fall precipitation, um, but the, the amount of the, the flow ratios that we get on it haven't changed at all. So it's the spring. Uh, event spring and early summer. We, we can't evaluate, we, we haven't looked at April because we have snowmelt complicating that one, but May, June, and July we've seen big increases in the, uh, uh, the flow ratios, whereas in the fall we don't, and yet in the fall we've had an increase in precipitation. So I think a lot of the water that's increasing in precipitation that's occurring in the fall is going back up to the atmosphere. So it, the, the timing is really important. But you bring out, I think, a really important point is that we need to better understand the mechanisms by which these, these uh, stream channel uh, processes are working, especially if we're going to try to fix them. Daniel, um, you talked about um, sediment delivery over here. No, no. You talked about sediment delivery and obviously the ag being the contributing source in comparison to urban. Um, makes sense. But if what you did do was look at the volume of water as we look at the impact of rivers and particularly checking below like Minneapolis and St. Paul. As we develop, as we create more impervious layer, um, what impact is the volume of water coming off the expanding urban areas having on this, the property? Well, um, in comparison to Thailand, let's say. it's comparable, it is, but that isn't the source of the sediment. No. And, and, and yes, no, it's, it, it's contributory for sure, but if you look at the, 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 the changes in flow in the river, it's, um, I think it would be a relatively minor effect. Um, and that it, it, you know, I think it would be worth, probably worth looking at if we have urbanized watersheds to see how they have changed. I think no doubt they would, yeah, I would say they would have an effect. But in terms of the total volume of water in the river, it's not, it's, it's not a big contributor. It's a big contributor for certain types of pollutants. And as I said, it's important for those smaller watersheds that flow through our urban neighborhoods and the water quality in those. And I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to uh, uh, argue or, or, or that, that that is important. But what's critical is to understand what the major sources are. And I was just trying to make a point that sometimes we will hear, oh, well, it's them over there, it's them over there. And I think it's really important at least for me as a scientist, to say, you know, what are the likely sources? What are the likely drivers? I don't have a stake in the results. I really, I'd be happy to find out that they weren't what they are. But I think it's important to take a good, cold, hard look at, at what we're doing. Dan? Yeah. Uh, I'm a volunteer stream monitor for the MPCA, and I'm going to, sh I'm in my fourth year now gathering data, and I'm going to share some results, some observations of my tracking, which kind of supports your your concept, uh, I start monitoring when I can climb down the bank to the stream about mid-March, and I'll monitor up through mid-November on a weekly basis, and I'm looking at water temperature, water clarity, turbidity, etc. and I have a measuring tube, which I do readings and whatnot, and some observations, spring runoff, 
uh, yes, there is turbidity, but it becomes very clear by notice and support of your heavy rainfall data. And it's interesting that you picked two inches or, or better as a significant rainfall event. My data shows after such event, if I recall now, the water turbidity 60 is considered pristine. My readings will drop down to single digits one week after a major rainfall. And, uh, and, and that's kind of interesting that you brought that up. Uh, and I do go in spikes. I'll go a period of time where there's, you know, and, and I think I, 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 my data totally supports that precipitation does impact turbidity. And also it's interesting, water temperature, and I'm not sure how water temperature plays in, and that's something you, the scientist, I don't know if that's a minor or, or insignificant impact, but uh, the data is there to show uh, on rainfall events. I just wanted to share some observations. Well, thank you. I, and, and I think this is something that all of us who have looked at rivers in either casually or at, 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 uh, in, in, in detail like you have, you know, we can see when the sediment moves. And I think that, that that's the critical thing here is that there are large periods, large parts of the year, particularly midsummer, when we have um, um, uh, either less precipitation or more evaporating back that, that uh, a lot of our tributaries in the Minnesota run pretty clear at that time of year. And certainly the, the river clears up out here. And uh, it's those conditions that we want to maintain under, under, you know, under the average or the median condition because that's what the biology responds to. And, uh, but these big events are what, what drive what, what is going on. And, uh, and I guess just to remake the point that I made earlier is that is that an increase in precipitation coupled with the land use effects have, you know, will, will drive a bigger effect. If we still had, you know, native prairie and, and three million wetlands out here, we probably wouldn't see an effect of those increased, those, those rainfall events, at least not to the same degree. We certainly know that even in pre-settlement times that if you had heavy rain that the Minnesota River would kick out some sediment. We know that from the Explorer records and so on, but nothing to the degree that it's doing today. I, you showed a uh, aerial photo, I think it was 1940 and recent, I don't know what year, on the same stretch of the river. And I was struck by the how many more trees there were now compared to 1940. It was many times more. Assuming they were taken at the same time of year, I think they were pretty close. And I'm making a point that doesn't have much to do with total tons of sediment, but it might have something to do with the volatile organic component that gets into the river and when it gets in the river. Yeah, I actually hadn't looked at that. I was more so focused on the, the river channel width. And that's work being done by um, some colleagues of mine. Um, uh, and, and so I haven't been involved in that. But I, I certainly, if you look at historic photos of almost any part of our, of our um, uh, farmed landscape, you'll see that, um, you know, there were a lot more trees today along our riverways than there were in the past a lot, and not in all cases, but in a lot of cases that we certainly have done, I think, a better job of, of trying to protect our repairing corridors and so on. And I think that's, that, that is a, that's an effort to be applauded. Um, but exactly how that would affect the amount of volatile organics in the river, I don't know, um, might be important. but. My guess most of those volatile organics are coming from the larger part of the watershed or from algal, algal production in the river. Just a guess. I have a question. If I could take you from the stream bank back to Lake Pepin. When you're doing your coring, uh, did you, what kind of evidence did you see for the clarity of Lake Pepin and also for the, any changes in the benthic life in the lake? Um, the, the strongest evidence or information we have on the clarity of Lake Pepin was the change in the types of algae that lived in the river or in the lake in the past. And uh, there are the, the type of algae that are well preserved in sediment cores are called diatoms. And they're an abundant, diverse, important group of algae, our most important group of algae. And there are several hundred species in, in, our, in our river, at least that we counted in the sediment cores. And some of them like to live on the bottom, attached to rocks and aquatic plants and, and even mud. And others like to live up in the water column there. We call those plankton. 
And what we noted was a very strong shift that in pre-settlement times, something like 80, 85 percent of the diatoms were benthic. They lived on the bottom. And what that tells us is the water was a lot clearer. And present day, just the reverse is true. Uh, we have probably 85, 90 percent of the I can't remember what the percentage is, but of the, of the diatoms, a very high percent are now plankton. So we've done a couple of things. We've decreased the, the light that's available to things that live on the bottom, whether they're um, higher aquatic plants like these various uh, aquatic uh, macrophytes that Norm was showing. Uh, or, or, um, or, and we've also increased the amount of nutrients in the river, which increases the growth of the algae that likes to live in the water column, you know, the planktonic algae but very strong indication of loss of water quality. I, I ran across a, a while ago, and I can't remember um, who sent it to me, but it was a really nice quote about the water clarity in the head of Lake Pepin. And of course, you wouldn't call the head of Lake Pepin today very clear, but it was a description of how clear the water was. You could see the sandy bottom down, I don't know, how many feet, and you know, uh, and I think, well, what did that system look like? You know, it's hard to imagine it today. But, um, and, and I'm, I'm hesitant to read too much into explorer accounts, but that struck me as, as, uh, as an indication of the kinds of changes that, that have occurred. So, yeah, the lake is, is a lot more turbid today. Oh. In your, hi, in your core sampling of the sediment of Lake Pepin, did you do any pollutant analysis, heavy metals, PCBs, and do you, are you going to share any of the results of those studies? Um, yeah, we did, and we published a number of papers on that, and I didn't put that in here because I thought I'd stick to the mud um, part of the story. Uh, but yes, we looked at, uh, particularly at heavy metal pollution in here, and that was everything from cadmium to mercury, lead, etc. And, um, and that's, a, that's a huge success story uh, because we see prior to, we see a huge, well we started, you know, if you can imagine that, that graph of sediment there, okay, and then it rises up and it rises, it depends on the metal we're looking at, but it rises up just dramatically uh, to, uh, in, 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 depends on the metal, but like lead or cadmium or even mercury, several hundred times the background level. And that peaks in the late 60s and early 70s, and then it comes down, it comes crashing down. Uh, and uh, to the point where we've reduced by about two-thirds the amount of metal pollution, and it's still on the way down, uh, because we've recently, in the new cores that we took just in 2008 from Pepin, we've reanalyzed and the concentrations are coming down again. So. Um, and what is that? That's the result of the Clean Water Act and the cleaning up of our point source pollution from our urban areas primarily. And um, that's a huge success and we should keep that in mind. You know, we have really improved water quality in this river and our other waters that have received um, those kinds of inputs. So there are successes and I just like, I think what we're looking at here is an effort to tackle a more difficult set of pollution, pollutants, pollutants that we generate inadvertently in our everyday activities and are much harder to control because they don't come out of a pipe. Yeah, I just wondered uh, if there's any way to feasibly uh, accommodate all this increased flow by stabilizing the banks, and kind of looking at each watershed individually and uh, you know, setting goals for each watershed, and they figure out how they're going to do it, where it's coming from, and then how they would go ahead and, and try and do it. And I don't know if it's too big a thing to try and stabilize banks, but well, that's that's sort of outside of my field. Maybe there's a good engineer in here who could uh, could do that. That's something that the NRCS would be looking at, and and it would be done on a local watershed basis. I think it is difficult. From my, my understanding, limited understanding, it is difficult to stabilize these features. Um, certainly uh, some, such as these uh, ravines, uh, we could improve those by you know, not, not uh, having major tile outfalls uh, dumping at the head of those because that just makes it worse. You know, delivering the water through a pipe down to the river bottom might help uh, stabilize ravines, um, things like that. Um, I, I don't know. Uh, it, I, 
I think this is something we really have to look at is are there ways to stabilize some of these features um, and uh, or can we help a natural process maybe the maybe they are maybe things are stabilizing in some fashion that's I think that's a, really one of the important next steps Dan we're going to take about three more questions we're blowing through the break but that's good I had a uh, <clears throat> water monitor in Watawan County and oh, okay. That area has got, I think, about 1,200 miles of streams. They're small, but uh, I guess the largest one is the Water One River. And I've been water monitoring now in just two seasons. But my question is, in the time since the early settlements when it was buffalo country, and we had grasses and wildfires. Were the stream banks covered with natural habitat like our prairie grasses, or were they horsetail, or were they, you know, cottonwood trees, or were there, were there, uh, you know, now, nowadays we have uh, buckthorn and we have, uh, and I've been going down to some of these streams and, you know, you look at the tree line and you think, well, there shouldn't be any erosion. Not the case. I go down there and I've been taking pictures and there's so little plant life underneath that tree story, it's bare ground. And when the river comes up, it sweeps across that and erodes that area, even though there's some small amount of plants there. Was there a question there? Yeah, well, I can, even if there wasn't, I'll respond. <laughs> um, well, there's, there's sort of, you know, it's, it's, it's a bit of a chicken and egg proposition if we have vegetation it will tend to hold banks but it depends on the scale of the flows and and how high they are and how steep they are um, we know that these bluff features once the river start stops attacking them they will lay back you know they'll erode to a, a, a less steep angle and they will become vegetated and you can see that there are there are old bluffs all over these river these, these dissected rivers like the Lesur and the Blue Earth and the Watnawan and, and there, the river has migrated, its, its channel has changed and so it is no longer hitting those bluffs. So they do lay back. I don't know what the pre-settlement vegetation looked like. We do know that there was active erosion in these stream channels. It was just at a much lower rate. And so I would imagine that some of them were more heavily vegetated, uh, but it, it would be just, you know, pure guesswork on my part to say what they look like. Um, I don't know. I think it contributes a lot to the center the river because there's nothing there you know, to stop the people. There's nothing there to stop the... the That's right. Well, that, that's what I was saying, is that a bare bank is certainly going to be more susceptible to erosion. But again, we know if you look at these high, high banks and bluffs, particularly these high bluffs along uh, uh, these, uh, these various tributaries to the middle of Minnesota, that no amount of vegetation is going to stay there very long because they, they cave in pretty rapidly. They're very high. They are uh, destabilized by high flows and they continue to erode back. And plants don't like that, you know. It takes a long time for, a, for these plants to get established and they just get washed away. So I think there's a feedback there. If we could slow that process, we might be able to revegetate them. But what if, what if we Next burned question. all the trees and then replanted it in the river? Go ahead. Um, before you said that the fall rains have been heavier, but the rivers haven't gone up that much? Um, what I said was that the flow ratios, the amount of flow that comes into the river relative to the change in precip hasn't changed. That, 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 that line that I showed earlier for, the, for like the spring and the, and the, was that the blue earth I showed you? Well, my thought is that the crop yields have doubled in the last 30, 40 years and we need water for the crops. So is maybe, you know, the water, the water is drained out of the ground or grown out of the ground more and that fall rain is recharging our soil moisture? I think so. I think it's probably a good part of it is we have a lot of evapotranspiration occurring. I think 200 bushel corn would take more water than 90 bushel corn. 
I think it would. And uh, I think that's a good point, uh, that, that the effects are different. The seasonality of rainfall is really critically important. Um, and, and, and I think that's why we haven't seen the effect of that fall precip. I had a question. Listening to Rich this morning in the Chesapeake Bay with the three dams, and now they're filled up and what's going to happen. It, it, when I was a young kid, we used to go by the Flying Red Horse that was up uh, from Shakopee up and look down there with water down there. Now when I look down there, there's no water, but it's all rushes. Was that a dam type of approach of the sediment going out there? I know you've done your cores in Lake Pippin. Did that settle out about that time and, and then go over and now is going into Lake Pippin? Has that been kind of a dam like in Chesapeake? Could we do something like that? Uh, there was only one tiny little dam built on the, you know, on the Minnesota River at the mouth and it lasted a couple of years and it was blown out. Well, the natural habitat holding it back. Right. I think, th th I think maybe the broader question you're asking is how has sedimentation in the floodplain of the Minnesota River affected sediment delivery and how have dams affected sediment delivery to Lake Pepin? And uh, there's sort of two parts to that answer. Uh, one is uh, not based on any, on, a, on, on any work that we've done, but the, the major lock and dams on, on the river went in in the 19, early 1940s and they trap sediment. Um, they trap a lot of sand, they trap some fines. The degree to which they reduce the sediment input to Lake Pepin, we don't know. But their construction, if anything, would have reduced the signal that we see of increased sediment delivery because they would trap it, at least for a period of time. How they modulated the signal that we, we see in the sediment record, I'm not sure. The other part which uh, has been raised as, a, as an issue is um, how has the modific how have modifications, uh, particularly in the lower Minnesota River, uh, for barge traffic and other things change the way the, the, the floodplain traps sediment. And uh, we're continuing to work on that right now by looking at sediment cores from floodplain lakes. Uh, started with Lake Snelling and we're going to work our way upriver. We've also been looking at bridge bore records, which are taken every time wherever there's a bridge crossing. Uh, Department of Transportation have bridge bores, that, bridge boring records that go back right down to bedrock or near bedrock. And, hundreds of feet, and we can calculate the long-term rate of infilling. Both of those uh, 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 lines of study have uh, indicated pretty clearly that, that we've increased substantially sediment accumulation in the floodplain. We, haven't, we aren't eroding out material out of the floodplain, but exactly what that balance is, we're not sure. It would have an effect. One last question. That was pretty close to my same question. I farm near Lesur and I see the, uh, the flood wall in Henderson and, and the other modifications near Mankato, so I was wondering how you account for those things and if you can measure the effects that, that other man-made effects that go back to early 1900s on what we've done to the river that either sped up the process or slowed it down. Right, right. Again, um, how, have, how have channel modifications affected sediment delivery? And um, first of all, we have to understand that in terms of the river channel itself, we do not store fine grade sediments at what, largely sandy bottom. There's too much flow. The channel does not store. It's an erosive feature. Where we store sediment is in the floodplain. That is, as the river rises out of its banks during high flow events, spills out, the water slows, the fine grained sediments fall out. And that's where we need to, 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 to look at how these, change, how, these, uh, uh, how these things may have changed over time. And that's what I was referring to. Um, and the best place to do that for us is the lower Minnesota uh, from basically from Shakopee on down. There's a lot of wetland systems in there. And from historic maps, they've been around from pre-settlement times, and we were, we're planning to take a closer look at those. But it's a good question. I would say that you can't explain the, 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 the big change that we see. It will modulate, it will have modulated the, the, the exact pattern, but you know, that, that is a change in sediment delivery, and we can see that from the studies that have been done, as I showed you from the, uh, the Lesur watershed, how we've really increased sediment delivery to the river itself. And, and so all these things enter in, but um, are, they don't change the, the, the primary story, which is one of land use effects on, on, um, on river flows and sediment delivery. Thank you, Dan.